Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2016 Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Tyrrell Museum and its Cooperating Society are pleased to welcome back a regular guest of the Speaker Series, Dr. John Node. John is a petroleum geologist based in Calgary. John obtained his undergraduate degree from Imperial College in London, England. After working for a few years as a mining geologist in South Africa and as a marine geologist in the UK, John completed a master's degree in sedimentology with his thesis focusing on the fluvial sequence stratigraphy of Dinosaur Provincial Park. Upon completing his thesis, John returned to London University as a full-time student working on his PhD on the sedimentary evolution of Eastern Borneo. After completing his PhD, John was lured by oil companies and over the years has worked on a variety of Middle Eastern and Canadian exploration projects. Through all of this, John has always been and remains a real paleontology enthusiast. Today, in a talk that promises to be very interesting, John will review famous cases of fossil misidentification. While some cases were honest mistakes made by scientists, others were forgeries made by people who wished to further an agenda or ideology. While these cases of misidentification resulted in some level, a level of embarrassment, all were resolved through scientific research. So without further delay, I present you Dr. John Node. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, as Francois said, thank you for the introduction. Today I'm going to be talking about fossil faux pas, which is uh, mainly about failures, fakes, and fraud. So all the Fs today. So humans have been misidentifying fossils for thousands of years, and we'll just touch upon some of the old ideas that people had about fossils back in uh, medieval and prehistoric, prehistoric times. But there's a lot of mistakes that have been made in more recent times, and some of these are intentional. Some of them are just complete misinterpretations. Some of them are things that aren't even fossils. Some of them are reconstructed back to front, upside down, inside out. And then we're even going to have a creationist example as well, because you should always have a little bit of con controversy in there. Um, I'm going to give examples of all of these today as we count down the top 12 fossil failures. And these demonstrate man's audacity, guile, stupidity, and greed. So some of our favorites here in Drumheller. So let's start off by talking about some of the, the, the old views of fossils and what fossils represented. And obviously in China, there are a huge amount of dinosaur bones and fossils. And I've got a picture here of a typical outcrop in uh, China. And uh, there's probably more fossil dinosaur eggs known from China than anywhere else in the world. And most of the ways that these were interpreted back in time were as dragons. And I've got a picture here of a plesiosaur next to a, a dragon skeleton just to show you how similar they are, so you can imagine why the mistakes were made. And dragon bones were used in a lot of ways, so they would literally cart the fossils out of the ground, grind them up into a fine powder, and then use them to make healing concoctions. And I've got some of the text here about what some, some of the things you could treat with these dinosaur bones. And I think the, my favorite is that manic running about. So if any of you guys are suffering from manic running about, then grab yourself a dinosaur fossil, crush it up, and you'll be able to sort yourself out. In the UK and in Europe, we uh, had a lot of kind of fairy lore associated with uh, ancient uh, fossils. And these are some of the names that we've used here. So I'm just going to go through some of the examples. We have a lot of echinoderms in the UK, particularly Jurassic and Cretaceous forms. And these were known as fairy loaves, shepherd's crowns, and snake eggs. And uh, this is just showing a couple of the echinoderms. And I put another, oh no, that's actually a piece of bread. I thought that was another echinoderm next to it, just to show you how similar they are. Then there's a lot of devil's toenails in the UK. These are Jurassic forms, Jurassic bivalves. So they're a little bit like oysters, which are called gryphia from a scientific viewpoint. And these were viewed as devil's toenails. Um, often when there'd been a lightning strike on the ground, the people would go out to look to see what had happened with the lightning strike, and the ground would be broken up and there'd be belemnites there. So they assumed that belemnites were something to do with thunderbolts or the remains of the lightning, the pointed ends of the lightning. These are trilobite tails that I put, just put two together just because they are, were always thought to be butterflies that had been turned to stone by Merlin, so the famous magician. So you can see that there definitely is a similarity there. And finally, there's a lovely story about uh, St. Hilda's serpents. So up in the... In the uh, uh, northeast of the UK in Yorkshire. We have a fantastic coastline there with the same age rocks that are uh, 
outcropping in Lyme Regis. And Lyme Regis is very famous for its fossils. But you have the same rocks in Yorkshire. And a lot of these beautiful ammonites, which are exposed along the coast, and they, they weather out, and you can find them on the beach. They're, they're upper, Jurassic, upper Liassic in age. And so some enterprising people put a story together that St. Hilda, who had a, a monastery there in, in the 6th century, that she had had an infestation of snakes in the monastery. And so being very religious and very powerful, she was able to turn all of these snakes to stone. So this is the crest of St. Hilda's College in Oxford. And you can see it actually has one of these turned to stone snakes with the head on. And then local people would carve the heads onto the ammonites and then sell them to tourists to demonstrate St. Hilda's powers. So what we're going to do now is that we're going to count down my own selection of the 12 most famous fossil faux pas, the, the frauds, the fakes, and just the complete failures in terms of making mistakes. And I, I'm illustrating the countdown begins with this collection of fossil scorpions here, which uh, comes from Morocco. And uh, one of the interesting things about these fossils is that amazingly, they're all exactly the same. So interesting. Anyway, we're going to start off with number 12, which is a fantastic news story that broke in 2012. And uh, 43 huge dinosaur eggs were found by Russian geologists in Chechnya. And I have a picture here of one of the Russian geologists, alleged geologists, standing next to some huge dinosaur eggs. I'm sorry for the quality of the, the picture. This was what I was able to find online. And it was in the Mirror in the UK, the Daily Mirror, our, our famous very scummy newspaper. But in lots of other newspapers as well, and even on things like CNN and on Sky, Sky as well. And I think this is possibly because it was a bit of a slow news day. I mean, dinosaurs are often in the news, but this was a bit of a random story. Anyway, it was picked up by National Geographic. And National Geographic were trumpeting the fact that these were the biggest dinosaurs ever found. And this is a quote from the, the chief geologist on the project who said, we got closer and we saw that they didn't look like stones. And they knew they were dinosaur eggs because they could see the shells, the whites, and the yolks, which is just amazing. And anyway, the observers were described as scientists. And you'll often find with these stories where they have a bit of a dubious quality to them that scientists are being deemed responsible for identifying these things. Anyway, the real answer is a lot more mundane than that. And these, you can see over here, I've got a few of these concretions, which is actually what they were. And... Uh, Concretions tend to form where you have a little bit of organic material in the sediment. You have groundwater moving through the sediment that's got a lot of chemical material in it. And that ground, that the chemical material will start precipitating on the, on the organic material. And a good example of this kind of formation is if you look in your kettle, you'll see your kettle element has got lime scale growing on it. And if your kettle element was round, you might end up with a dinosaur egg in your kettle because this is how they thought they formed. So I've got an example here from Utah from uh, Marjorie Chan, one of her, her um, papers that she recently wrote, just showing that you can have hundreds of these concretions. And these ones are ironstone cemented, so that's why they're so dark. But these would also be an equivalent to what these guys were calling dinosaur eggs. And actually, any self-respecting sedimentologist just looking at these guys would instantly say that it was a concretion. And there was one Russian paleontologist in Moscow who actually just said, this is a load of old rubbish. Anyway, just... On a kind of side note, I went to Singapore years and years ago to Sentosa, and they had a, a kind of geology museum, kind of by scientists, and it had things like rocks that were in the shape of the different Chinese animal symbols from year to year, and it also had this fantastic mammoth egg that they'd found. And this mammoth egg, not actually a concretion, it's actually made of granite. It's a granite mammoth egg that they had on display in the museum. So it kind of goes with this, this bit of uh, flim flam. We're going to move on to number 11 now, and we're going to talk about Iguanodon. And I think everybody is pretty familiar with the Iguanodon, Iggy, a lovely duck-billed dinosaur known from around the world. And uh, when it was first found, what happened, the story is that Mantell, who was a famous paleontologist back around 160, 170 years ago, he was driving along in his carriage with his wife, and the, the wheel broke, which is serendipitous because his wife got out and she was wandering around and she found some iguanodon teeth and they looked just like iguana teeth but which which are probably this size but they were about 10 times the size so he mantel was very excited and they ended up naming this creature iguanodon which means iguana tooth and anyway when they reconstructed this dinosaur after they started finding some skeletal material this is how it was reconstructed so you've got this large 
portly animal who's obviously had a bit too much for lunch hanging out and he's got a beautiful nose spike on his nose because then this is what the spike looked like when it was found as a fossil. So these were displayed at the Great Exhibition in the UK in 1851 and then they moved to Crystal Palace and they were stored at Crystal Palace and you can still go and see these models today. One of the nice things is that when the models were made they held a, a, a party before they put them on display and, and eight famous geologists of the day actually sat inside this animal and had their dinner. They took the top off and they all sat inside and had dinner there to celebrate this. So this was the idea. You had Iguanodon with its nose spike and it was only when 60 skeletons were discovered in a coal mine in Bernassart in Belgium that they realized that actually it wasn't a nose spike at all. It was actually a thumb spike. And there is the same spike which originally was on the nose. What happened was this is a, a, a kind of simple cross section of this coal mine. So they, they put the shaft down and they were going across mining the coal in these brown sediments. And then they, they found this kind of funnel of sandy sediments in there. And in the sandy sediments was a lot of kind of black material. And the, the black material was all bone. So these, what they did was that they, they realized something was going on, called in the, the Natural History Museum in Brussels, and uh, they realized that these were iguanodon skeletons. And they ended up taking out 60 skeletons, which they think were, fo were fossilized during floods. And as you can see, because they've got so many of these, they were able to put together a really fantastic display. And I recommend going and visiting the, this museum in Brussels if you ever get the chance, because there's a lot of these skeletons there. And they were all pyrotized, so they had to be kept in kind of uh, controlled conditions. But anyway, because they had all these brilliantly preserved skeletons, they were able to realize that, that, that originally they had made a mistake. And actually, these thumb spikes were some kind of stiletto. So this guy had a, a bit of a shiv in his pocket that he could pull out if anybody tried to attack him. We're now moving on to number 10. And uh, the, the, this is a, a very nice story from the UK, which is obviously where I'm from originally. And... Uh, this lady, Tina Niga, she was about 15 years old, and she went on a geography field trip in Leicestershire. And they took them to this quite exposed area in Leicestershire called Charmwood Forest. And there are rocks outcropping there. This is what the rocks look like. They're a bit featureless. They're kind of purpley quartzites, so they're, they're a little bit uh, baked up and metamorphosed. And the outcrops were around 560 to 600 million years old. Anyway, Tina was a pretty observant girl, and she noticed there were these markings on the rock. And she uh, pointed them out to her teacher, her geography teacher, and said, I think I found some fossils over here. And he told her not to be so stupid, because obviously there's no fossils in the Precambrian. In fact, he said everyone knew that there were no fossils in the Precambrian. So even though they'd found similar fossils in Namibia and Australia, these were all thought to be Cambrian. So that it was clearly that the case that they couldn't be fossils. Anyway, the next year, the same geography trip went to the same quarry, and this time there was another schoolboy, a year younger, Roger Mason, and he noticed the same fossil, and he pointed it out to his teacher as well, and one thing led to another, and it was brought to everybody's attention, and finally, everybody realized that there actually were fossils in the Precambrian. So for a, the, the fossil itself was called Charnia Mason, Masony, so it was named after Roger Mason, and it's a nice story. I met Roger in, in the UK, and he went on to be a professor of uh, metamorphic petrology, so he actually ended up being a geologist as well. Anyway, he took all of the, the credit for this, but not really his fault, but the nice thing was that about 40 years later, Tina was finally recognized as the person who had first found these fossils. So uh, she did get some recognition, and she's still a member of the geology group in, in Charmwood Forest. So this is what the outcrops look like. And this is a photo that I took. This is my gloved finger for scale because it was blooming freezing there when we went to visit. We went in December. And this is a, a typical example of these fossils. So you can see that it is a little bit tough to recognize them in the field without any doubt. There are, there are questions about their validity as fossils. But when you see a really beautiful specimen, and this was the one that Tina and Roger actually found. This is a cast of that fossil you can see that they really are amazing animals. So these animals are now considered to be a complete different offshoot to anything that we have today. And they were living in a time where there were really no predators that we know of. So they could afford to be soft bodied and hang about on the seabed, living their lives. And there, there was really nothing to eat them. So there wasn't a need for them to develop protective uh, exoskeletons. 
And the, the fauna is called Ediacaran fauna, and it's named after this area in Australia where there's a, 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 also a great deal of, of different uh, fossils that are preserved there of this type. So yeah, so that's a lovely story, and it's kind of nice that Tina finally got her recognition. But yeah, if, if anyone does ever show you a fossil, just say, oh, everyone knows that's not a fossil. Okay, so we're now going to move on to number nine, and this is Noah's raven. And uh, this is another story of a, a it's got quite a similar start to it. So Pliny Moody, he was uh, actually trying to get a doorstep for his house. And so he went out and he found this block of rock, which I will show you on the next slide. And it had these strange kind of footprints in it. And he thought they must be giant turkey footprints. I mean, that's the obvious solution, isn't it? And a local doctor far smarter than him, James Dean, his name was, which is, I don't think he's any connection to the James Dean. But anyway, he said that they were actually the tracks of Noah's raven. And it was just great that they'd been found in, in uh, Massachusetts. So uh, this interpretation was supported by scientists from Yale and Harvard. So obviously, that was the correct interpretation. Anyway, the state geologist, Professor Hitchcock, and Hitchcock's birds is quite funny because he, he said he thought they were made by giant birds. And, it, and I was trying to do a search to find pictures of Edward Hitchcock and, and some of his reconstructions because I have seen a picture somewhere. And every time I did a search on Hitchcock and giant birds, I got a picture of this lighthouse with this woman going like this and being attacked by birds for any of you who've ever seen Hitchcock's film. Anyway... These footprints, there are actually lots and lots of these footprints in Connecticut Valley and uh, all over Massachusetts as well. And it's possible that the, this great father mosquito, which is a First Nations legend, was that this mosquito was flying around bigger than a bear. And then the, the um, First Nations guys sick the spider and bat onto it. And spider ma the giant spider made a huge web. And the bat drove this mosquito into the web. And the, the giant mosquito broke into a million pieces. And unfortunately, each drop of its blood became a mosquito. And that's why we have so many mosquitoes today. But that story is also thought to be based on these footprints. Anyway, now we, we this is Moody's trackway, by the way. This is his original doorstep that he used. And uh, as, as we know, these are now considered to be dinosaur footprints. So there's at least five types of these footprints. This is in Rocky Hill in Connecticut. You can go and visit here. They've got a beautiful geodesic dome that covers these. And you can go outside and make your own cast of the footprints as well. And very enterprising shop just down the road has become a gypsum shop. It, it used to sell, be a grocery, but basically now it just sells gypsum because you turn up here and they say, well, if you want to cast your own fossils, you're going to need cooking oil and you're going to need gypsum. So everybody heads off down the road to buy themselves a bag of gypsum. So this shop makes a fortune just out of this place, which is a nice story. Anyway, just to kind of put this into context, this is uh, Triassic, so maybe 220 million years ago. And it's interpreted as these big area of sand flats. A lot of dinosaurs walking through there. They've got pterosaur fossils as well, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. So it's kind of coastal environment. And this is how they've done the, the um, reconstruction. And one of the dinosaurs that they're pretty sure has made most of these three-toed tracks is Dilophosaurus. And for any of you guys who've seen Jurassic 2, it's that one that's looking quite innocent. And the, the guy is going, oh, there's a nice dinosaur. And then it suddenly lifts up its crest and goes and sprays him with um, poisonous spit. So it's that kind of dinosaur. Right. This is um, close to my heart. I think maybe last year or the year before, I gave a talk here about provincial fossils and about the problems we have in Canada with the lack of provincial fossils. Only one province has its own fossils. Anyway, in the states, there are, there are only seven states that don't have their own state fossil. And this lady here, who was about eight years old, Olivia Lee McConnell, she went to this restaurant. And in the restaurant, in the menu, they had uh, all of the different state things. And they had a state flower. They had a state embroidery. They had all these weird state things for the state of South Carolina, but they didn't have a state fossil. And she got on her high horse about this and wrote to the, the, the Senate to say that she thought that they should have a state fossil. And it's quite interesting. If you look back at the history of state fossils, about 80% of state fossils have been suggested by children. It's the children who drive this. The children, their school, often the child has some 
illness that makes everybody feel sorry for them. And, and anyway, that is how state fossils tend to get started off. So anyway, Olivia suggested that the mammoth would be a good one because that it was the very first vertebrate fossils found in the United States were found in South Carolina, dug up by slaves, and they were mammoth teeth. So she suggested this. So it went to the state house, and they passed it, as you can see, 94 to 3, which is a pretty, pretty good, obvious vote. But then creationist Senator Bryant decided to insert the words, as created on the sixth day. And so this is what his, his suggestion was. The Columbia mammoth, which was created on the sixth day, is designated as the official state fossil and must be referred to as the Columbia Mammoth, which was created on the sixth day. So he was in, ob obsessed with getting his religious beliefs in there. So anyway, it didn't happen in the end. He was laughed out by the rest of the Senate. And uh, my suggestion is that maybe Brian should be the state fossil for his fossil views. But anyway, so it was, it was a good news story in the end. We're now going to move to Mongolia, and uh, I know there's people in the audience here who've been to Mongolia and collected dinosaurs. Sadly, I never have, but if anybody would like to fund me, then I'm more than up for it. Anyway, during one of the many ex expeditions that have been made to Mongolia because of its amazing dinosaur treasure, treasure trove of fossils, a guy called Olson, who was a technician, and you often hear about the technicians, the journalists, all of the kind of other guys who obviously had nothing better to do than stand around smoking and finding fossils, because there's, there's a picture, literally, of not Olsen, but one of the journalists smoking a cigarette and finding a, a protoceratops egg site. Anyway, these guy, this guy found this, this uh, really amazing fossil. It was the same, roughly the same age as the dinosaurs that we find in Dinosaur Provincial Park. And the fossil that he found was something like this. And there's some question about the exact fossil itself. When you go on the internet, some people say, well, these were, these were Ornithoraptor fossils, some people say, well, these are actually another dinosaur, Chittipati. So anyway, he found something that was very much like this. So what happened, there were eggs in the, in the fossil. So you can see the eggs there. There's eggs there. There's eggs over here as well. And then they're covered by this obvious predatory dinosaur with these big claws. And that dinosaur was a brand new discovery when Olsen discovered it. And they called it egg stealer because obviously, it's sitting on top of this nest of protoceratops eggs, and it's stealing the eggs. So ornithoraptor means egg stealer. So this, this guy was an egg thief. And ornithoraptor itself, there's only been this one fossil found, but it had a, a lizard in its stomach, so clearly it was some kind of meat eater. And uh, ever since then, whenever you see a picture of ornithoraptor in, in a dinosaur book, it's either carrying an egg like this, <laughs> or it's literally kind of like digging its nose into an egg and eating the eggs, because that's what those mean dinosaurs did. However, however, as time went on, they found a lot of these other fossils from this dinosaur Chittipati, which it's, it, it means something like funeral, fi, funeral site or something like that, because they found a lot of them together. It, it, it collected the, the dead bodies of the dinosaurs. Anyway, when, when you find all of these dinosaurs, again and again, what you see is dinosaurs curled up on their nests. And the eggs that were associated with these guys were exactly the same as the ornithoraptor eggs. And the skeletons of these dinosaurs were very similar to the ornithoraptors. So putting all of this together, the, the scientists, but these were real scientists, realized that not, ornithoraptor was not an egg stealer. It was actually just a good mother. So this dinosaur that's sitting on, on its nest here is not, not browsing on protoceratops eggs. It was trying to protect its own eggs. And the, the interpretation is that there was a, probably a big sandstorm, and the mother was trying to shield her eggs with her body. And then the sandstorm was so intense that she ended up being choked and dying. So it's really sad that this poor dinosaur has ended up with the name Egg Stealer when it should be called Good Mother or maybe Good Father, because it could have been the dad sitting on the eggs as well. well we, we won't know. OK. Number six. Number six is another sad story, but this is more about fraud than anything else. And this relates to a chap called Beringer, Edvard Beringer, who was a German professor. And he was known for being a bit of an arrogant so-and-so. He clearly thought that Edvard Beringer was one of the best scientists out there. And he was a senior professor in Würzburg. So, Back in, 18, in 1725, the same year, funnily enough, that those mammoth teeth were being found by the slaves 
in the States. Three local boys brought him some amazing fossils from Mount Eivelstadt. And he asked them where they collected these fossils, and they went back and showed him. And in the end, with the boy's help, he was able to collect over 2,000 stones. And we've got to remember back at this time that there was no paleontology. Uh, people had to make up their own ideas about what was going on. So these stones feature, you can see some in his treatise here that he published. They featured plants, insects, birds, and even Hebrew symbols. And Beringer put this treatise together which described, these are some of the actual specimens which still survive today. So you can see that they're, they're really beautifully made. Anyway, they're, they, they're really beautifully preserved, I should say. Probably would be better. And his treatise, he had a lot of explanation about how God had created these stones for him to find on the hillside. And it was proof of how wonderful God was. So soon after publishing the treatise, he was given a, another stone, which unfortunately had his own name on it. And it was pretty clear that he'd just been taken for a complete ride. So it turned out the stones were a hoax, and they'd been concocted by two jealous colleagues from the academic society. And when they went back and looked at these, these things that had been created, they could even see that there were chisel marks on them. But, and he had just said that obviously God had chiseled these shapes out, and God had done it just for him. So he was really famously arrogant, and he was refused to accept that this could have been a hoax. Anyway, this is a, just to show a picture. Of, this is from the, the, the um, frontispiece for, from his treatise, just to show that he's got this picture with uh, this stack of fossils here on his hill. Anyway, the good thing for Beringer was that he was really, really upset about this, and he took these two guys to court, and he won the court case. And the two men, these guys, Roderick and Von Eckhart, who were trying to make him look like a fool, they were shamed as well. But unfortunately, the stigma wiped off on him as well, and he lost his job, so all three of them, ended up. So he got his revenge. I put up here, revenge is a dish best served cold. So he got his revenge, but he ended up losing his job as well. And I thought in here that I would just mention this, this other case here where there was a journalist in Dan De Quiel, his name was, and he wrote this joke article about the traveling stones of Franagat Valley. And these are the traveling stones. And what he said was that if you found pairs of these stones, if you moved them and you went back after a couple of months, the stones would have moved back together. So he called them the traveling stones. And this story was, it was a complete joke. He should have written it on April Fool's Day. But anyway, he, he wrote this joke and everybody believed it. And 40 years later, people were still contacting him to talk, ask him about the traveling stones, to come up with all these theories about electromagnetic currents and these stones have somehow been imprinted with something that made them pull that together. So he was trying to have a bit of a laugh at the, at the journal's expense, and it kind of bit back because he, he, is, he is still answering questions about these silly stones that he made up the story about. So that's another example of a bit of revenge. We're now going to move on to talk about heads and tails, and this relates back to Cope and Marsh. And Cope and Marsh were probably, I would say, the most famous paleontologists, if not of their day, of all time. And they had these bone wars back maybe 100 years ago, 100, 150 years ago, where they were desperately trying to collect all the new dinosaurs throughout the central United States. And it got so desperate that if Cope couldn't get to a quarry to collect a dinosaur before Marsh was going to get there, then Cope would send his guys in to smash up the bones so that his, his, uh, enemy, his sworn enemy couldn't, do it, couldn't collect them himself. So... These two guys had a lot of competition between them. But between them, they found 170, 180 different species of dinosaurs found and named. So they did do a lot of good, but they, they, they were also a little bit, uh, sometimes they'd take the shortcut. Anyway, what Edward Cope, he, his people, his, his um, collecting staff found this, well, not this particular elasmosaur, but they found the, the first fossil elasmosaurus. And they collected this Elasmosaurus, and this is all the bones that they collected. And Elasmosaurus is an amazing reptile. It has more vertebrae than any other animal, including 71 neck vertebrae. Now, it's a little bit unfortunate that Cope 
his speciality was lizards. And if you think of lizards, they have a pretty short neck and they have a very long tail. So he, he had kind of lizards on his mind. So when he got this skeleton of this elasmosaurus, obviously he thought, well, this is kind of lizard thing. So there's the lizard's short neck. So he popped the head on and there's the long tail. But as it turned out, the head was on the wrong end. So you can see from this elasmosaurus, there's this really long neck and there's a pretty short tail there and, and in this picture as well. Uh, no, sorry, that's what elasmosaur should look like. And then this is Cope's re reinterpretation, his reinvention showing the short neck and the long tail of, of his elasmosaurus. So this was eventually pointed out at a scientific meeting by Joseph Leidy and Le Leidy Suchus is another dinosaur. So this was another dinosaur specialist and he basically said, well, excuse me, it's a very nice thing that you've done, Dr. Cope, but you're completely wrong, and the head's on the wrong end. And Marsh was so excited about this that he tried to take credit for pointing out this mistake because he wanted to crow over his rival, but it was actually Joseph Lady in 1870 who pointed out that this mistake had been made. So you would think to yourself, well, this has happened once, this wrong, wrong head story. Surely it couldn't happen again. However, in a quite a similar episode, Marsh found the first Brontosaurus, but it didn't have a head. So what would you do if you found a dinosaur without a head? He kind of looked around and he said, well, there's Camarasaurus. It's a long neck as well. And this is what Camasaurus's head looks like. So he, he built this head, literally just kind of like made it out of plaster. And they used that as the head of Brontosaurus. And incredibly, that head survived until 1978. So that's 100 years that they basically had the wrong head on this dinosaur. And there's lots of pictures reconstructing Brontosaurus. And this is what its head should really look like. But it's been stuck with this dumpy, unattractive head for all that time. And it, it's not like this wasn't pointed out through, through history. Back in 1915, it was it was suggested that really they should have a more slender, narrow head, much more like a diplodocus. But anyway, it wasn't really corrected until a lot of really excellent work by Macintosh and Berman, who, who did a lot of comparative anatomy and put the story together and just said, come on now, guys, you've got the wrong head on here. And, and while we're talking about Brontosaurus, this is not, it's not exactly a fossil faux pas, but it, it has a really exciting history, Brontosaurus, about its name. And I'm sure many of you have been told Oh, no, 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 it's not Brontosaurus, it's actually Apatosaurus. So the dinosaur was named Apatosaurus in 1877. Misnamed Brontosaurus in 1885. Corrected to Apatosaurus in 1903. And then Brontosaurus rose from the flames like a giant long-necked phoenix in 2015, based on a new paper by Schopp et al. So right now, if you believe the, the findings of the paper, and there's no reason not to, the name Brontosaurus is back. And it's, it's very interesting when you do look at all the, the kind of the cladistics and the work that's done on these kind of fossils, is that there's, there are hundreds of fossils that have been found of these animals. Often they're partial. Sometimes there they're are bones from multiple individuals in one quarry, and that's particularly true of, of Brontosaurus or Apatosaurus, that you tend to find multiple dissociated skeletal pieces of these animals. So they put it all together, and it's very difficult to try and tease out which are the real species from these animals. So hopefully we can stick with a Brontosaurus, because that's what I grew up with. That's my favorite dinosaur, so it, it's very nice to have Brontosaurus back, I have to say. I'll just wipe a tear before, before we go on. Okay, so moving to Canada now, I've actually got two stories from our, our famous Burgess Shale. So I'm, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the Burgess Shale. It outcrops um, close to field. A whole series of outcrops, actually. Uh, the first one that was discovered was discovered in the early 1900s by a chap called Walcott, who was the director of the Royal Ontario Museum. This is what the quarry looks like. This is called Walcott's Quarry, although it's a lot bigger than when he first found this outcrop. Anyway, it's uniquely important because it has this incredible soft-bodied fauna. A lager statin, which is a, it's a, a German term for where you have unusual soft-bodied material preserved. It's not just the bones and the shells. Here you get everything. You get the tentacles, you even get the guts and the gut contents. Since this first discovery, 
as I said, another 25 sites or so have been, have been identified in the same area of, this, of this, these age rocks. And further discoveries in places like um, Namibia again, and particularly in China, have uh, increased our knowledge of these animals. Anyway, Walcott was the very first guy to find, find the fossils. And uh, as you can see, these fossils are typically preserved as, as kind of black outlines on the rock. And what's nice about them is that you can kind of scrape away the layers of rock, microscopically thin layers, and actually get a three-dimensional picture of what's going on with the animal. Anyway, among the fossils that Walcott identified were, uh, was a jellyfish, a sponge, and a shrimp. And this is a, the shrimp, and this is the jellyfish. So for a long time, these, these parts, these body parts, were considered as three different animals. And it was only when complete anomalocarids, like this chap here, started turning up, which is up to three feet in length. So this is something that's at the very dawn of hard-shelled animals, the very base of the Cambrian. And you do not expect to see three-foot-long predators at that time. And there were, there were no backboned animals even at this stage. So it was only when they started finding complete, complete um, fossils of these animals that they realized that they'd, they'd made a bit of a boob. And what they had was the mouth parts, the appendages, and then the body, which they named as a shrimp. So it, it's more like a kind of crustacean-like animal. And it, it was the apex predator back in those days. And it's quite kind of nice because these, these tentacles, they're, they're very robust. And you find these around the world. So if you're ever looking for another Burgess Shale style assemblage, then nice to, if you can find something like this, then that's a good hint that you're on the right track. I mean, we, they, they even occur in the Devonian in the UK. So these animals were very successful. Burgess part two. So this was, Anomalocaris was not the only animal that was mis, misinterpreted back in the day. And probably the most famous animal from the Burgess Shale, arguably with the uh, Anomalocaris as well, is this guy here. And this is Hallucigenia. And just the name, Hallucigenia, suggests that you've just, whew, beautiful looking animal. Hallucigenia, it really looks like something out of a hallucination with these weird spike shaped legs and this odd kind of tubes on its back. So this is the initial reconstruction of this animal. This is what it looks like as a fossil. And the fossil picture I've shown here, I've put the same way up as here with these paired legs and these tubes on top. So this is the initial reconstruction, but a lot of work has been done since then. And finally, this is what our hallucigenia looks like today. So his legs, his spiky legs, have turned out to be some kind of defense mechanism on his back, these spikes. And when they went down into the rock, so when they started scraping away where these tubes are, they found that there were paired sets of these tubes. So it's likely that these kind of spindly legs that he has here, these tubes, they were actually his legs. And at one stage, they even had it back to front. They're still not quite sure whether this bulbous bit here is at the back or the front. And it's kind of funny that we, we have these fossils and they're beautifully preserved, but it's still difficult to interpret them. And things have gone backwards and forwards about where this fits in with other, other animals. And right now, we're back where we think that they are a kind of velvet worm or a precursor of velvet worms. And velvet worms still exist. They live in the tropics. This is a, one wandering along on a tropical plant. And uh, the, the reason why they think that there's a relationship between these is that their claws have a very similar kind of conical cone in cone structure. And just one other little interesting fact about Hallucigenia is that uh, Des Collins, who did an awful lot of work on these rocks, he believes that there's some sexual dimorphism in these guys as well. So there are, there's differences between the males and the females. And being as this ideas came in kind of the 70s and perhaps a bit before the age of enlightenment, the males were supposed to be the big robust ones and the females were supposed to be the small dainty ones. But I'm not sure whether that's the case. It could easily be the other way around. So this brings us to our top three. And I've chosen this fossil platypus here, which is from China, to illustrate the top three. It's, it's a beautiful fossil, but I think there's a few indications here that perhaps this isn't 100% real. And what we're going to talk about at number three is Moroccan fakes. Uh, has anybody here ever been to Morocco? OK. Sorry to hear that. You should definitely go. If you ever want to pick up some brilliant fossil fakes, Morocco is the place for you. Um, 
I have to tell a little story. I, I went to Morocco and I went to a rock shop and I bought this, this fossil about this big and it's a block. It's got, actually, we, we can have a look at it in a minute. I've got a picture of similar one on the next, in fact, very similar one on the next page. It had one trilobite in the middle and it had five trilobites swimming around it, all perfectly positioned around the fossil. And I was chatting to the guy who had the rock shop and I said I was a geologist and he said, you know, this is one that we made and I said, how much is that? And it cost me four euros. And uh, I was living in Holland at that time and I went back to Holland and about four weeks later, there was a rock fair and uh, I turned up there and they were selling one of these specimens at the rock fair. And does anybody want to hazard a guess how much that same specimen that I paid four euros for? Anyone want to have a guess how much it cost? 650 euros to you, sir, for exactly, and not just a similar fossil, exactly the same fossil as mine. They were identical. Imagine that. So anyway, here we have these pictures from some Moroccan fossils. We have a lovely crinoid. We have a whole set of um, trilobites here. These are all individual trilobites. We have uh, this orthoco nautiloids polished up. We have this trilobite with his spines, lovely ammonite, and then we have this um, plesiosaur here as well. So I'll, I'll let you guys have a guess out of these six, which three are real and which three are fakes. This is a guy working, making my fossil, by the way, up in the corner there. Okay, so that, that's the answer to that one. These guys are completely fake. This is carved out of a piece of limestone. It's a beautiful carving, but it is still a carving. And this guy over here, there's bits of him that are real, but they've basically been completely reconstructed, stuck together, and he's what's called a composite. So that some of him is real and a lot of him isn't. And unusually, this trilobite is actually real. And you can imagine how long it takes to prepare one of these specimens. And you guys at the Tyrol are no strangers to taking a long time to pre prepare a fossil properly. This is probably 300 hours of work to prepare this guy that's only this big. So amazing specimen, really beautifully done. But of course, you don't have to take all that time. You can just grab some pointy bits off these guys and just stick them on a normal trilobite. And this is what they've done with some of these. these all of these guys here, this is what we, we've called the Moroccan trilobite wall of shame. Because all of these guys top to bottom, are completely fake. And how do you go about it? Well, first of all, you grab yourself a piece of real rock. And that's basically where the real stuff ends. After that, it's all just fun and games. You take some resin, and you mix that resin with rock dust, a bit of soil, and a bit of boot polish. And then you use that to cast your specimen. So you'll use that to cast your trilobite. You apply a bit of chemical sealant, which can make them a little bit shiny, but that's okay because you just say that you've used a, a, a rock sander just to, just to make them look shiny. And then you add a whole load of scratches around the edge of these specimens. So whenever you see these trilobites, what you always see are these kind of like scratches around the edge. And that's supposed to make you think that the guy has spent a lot of time preparing and scratching through the rock just to ping off the rock from the fossil. But it's actually to cover up the joins. So whenever you see those scratches, Always be suspicious that you may not have a real specimen. Now, as if that wasn't enough, as if having one of these guys wasn't enough, why not put six of them on the same rock? Or have six of them dancing around? This is, this is my fossil, by the way. Remember the one I told you about? 650 euros to you. I can do it for 600. And so you put six of them on a rock, and then you can charge six times the price. Why have one when you can have three or four? Look at all of these guys here. Every one of these is a fake made up of all of these guys together. And actually, death assemblages are vanishingly rare in the fossil record. I mean, we're very lucky in Dinosaur Park to have a few bone beds, but typically, fossils do not get washed into huge groups, particularly when they're the size of some of these trilobites, which are this big. And finally, what also it should alert your spidey senses is that typically, if you go on, the, on eBay, and eBay is really the place to learn about this stuff, you'll pay 50 bucks for one of these. And you would think to yourself, wow, that's really, really reasonable. I can't believe it's so cheap. I'd better put a bid in right now. And that's exactly what they're hoping that you'll do. And most of them, it's free postage. But some of these fossils, which are literally just handcrafted, takes about two hours, and they'll be selling them for hundreds and hundreds of euros. So a few hints and tips for you guys, if you are fossil collectors. First of all, I have one of these at home, identical to this. I paid three euros for it because 
It's it was clearly a fake. And one of the things that made me realize that it was a fake was these bubbles. So quite often to help fix the resin, they pop them in the oven and the resin bubbles a little bit. So you're kind of thinking if this is a real trilobite, it's pretty unlikely that it's going to have a pitted surface with these bubbles in it. So that should be a good clue to you. The second thing is that if you look at this guy, here's the rock, which is kind of brownish color. And then if you look at the matrix between the trilobite segments, that matrix is white. Now, why would you have white rock around your trilobite and have brown rock in the background? Well, it's a good question, and that should also alert you. Another thing is that quite often they'll make a couple of cracks in your specimens to make them look like they're real. So they'll have a crack there. But those cracks will not extend to the edge of the fossil. So they'll go to the edge of the fossil, but not into the matrix as well. So if you've got a crack that stops at the edge of the fossil, then probably you have something like this. And this is a lovely example here where this is a rock, obviously, and this is the fossil which has been cast. And then you basically take that fossil and you put it in there and you stick it in with resin, a bit of glue. You do some scratches around the edge like this just to make it look good. And there's your fossil. And there's suddenly there's 200 euros instead of about three euros for the, the work that went into it. Now, Next, the fossil surfaces and the trilobite eyes should be really sharp and, and really pitted, and they should have definition. And if you look at the surface of a trilobite, or even a, a bivalve shell, what you'll notice is it has what's called terracing. So it has like little tiny kind of like separate layers as the animal has built up its exoskeleton. So when you see these guys, clearly, because they're just cast, they, they don't have them. They're really smooth. So they look lovely and smooth, but the lovely and smooth should also be a flag. The edges should be sharp, and this guy here, if you zoom in, if you take your hand lens along when you go and look at these things, what you'll see is that it's basically just been drawn on with a permanent marker, or it's been painted with acrylic. So it's very easy to tell from that kind of like amorphous edge, it's not a sharp fossil. The edges should be sharp. You can use UV light and solvents to identify the resin. There's nothing worse than getting this nice fossil and thinking, oh, I'll just clean it up with a bit of solvent. And the whole fossil dissolves before your eyes, which you've just paid 200 euros for. As I said, look for composites. So that's when bits of other fossils are put together. And the stuck on spines, and I was quite serious. This, this guy here, his spines from this, so you can see what's happened here. First of all, there's the cast of the trilobite. It's been stuck into this, onto this block, so it's not original. And then all of these spines are taken from orthoconautiloids. And they just take the little spines off them and they stick them onto the trilobite very carefully so that they look original. And I mean, that trilobite there that we talked about, that would sell for $12,000. So it's worth taking the time to stick them onto your fake if you can get even 1000 for them. And uh, I, th I didn't mention this guy here just to show you. This one here, they've stuck the trilobite onto the, the base. The ba this is the base rock here. Scratched it all up so it looks real. But when you cut it in half, there's actually a space underneath the trilobite because they haven't even bothered to fill the gap in. They've just stuck that trilobite onto the rock. So just to talk a little bit more about fakes, this is just to show the evolution of the fakes through time. So initially, they used carving, or they just carved the resin. And now that you can see that they're doing a lot better job, but there's still things that will alert you. So look at this one here. You can actually kind of track the edge around where this fossil has been stuck onto the back. Um, They've, the resin trilobites, are, yeah, they're inserted into the rock, and the resin is mixed with rock dust to make it look more convincing. And they, can, they, they do paint them quite carefully. So that looks pretty good, that edge there. But we can tell very well from this, the, the fact that it's set into place that this is a fake. So yeah, so they're getting better, but you guys should still be able to tell the difference. That's Moroccan fakes. You can tell that's a bit of a favorite subject of mine. We spent a bit of time there, but we're now going to move on to the, the top two. And number two is one that Francois actually asked me if I was going to talk about, which is Archaeoraptor. And Archaeoraptor was an amazing discovery, possibly a little bit too amazing. And it was described as the missing link between dinosaurs and birds. So this, this is not Archaeopteryx. This is Archaeoraptor. And this is how it was reconstructed. And it was first described in a National Geographic article in 1999. Obviously, National Geographic is not a scientific peer-reviewed journal. They actually, it's a long and complicated story about the work that they went through. What happened was that the, 
the fossil was originally bought for $80,000 from a dealer. It had been illegally exported from China. And it was bought by the Dinosaur Museum in Utah. They, they tried to get it published in Nature and Science, Science magazines, journals, and they both refused to publish it. They went to Phil Curry, and he looked at it and said, I don't think that this is just one animal. And so in the end, National Geographic, they are their own people, and they went ahead and they just published it in this article. It's a missing link, they said, based on one guy who is not, a, not an expert geologist, but is, it, he does own a dinosaur museum. So this is what, how things stood after they published the article. There were a lot of people who were pretty unhappy about it. And why do you think that was? Well, the fossil actually turned out to be a composite of five different animals. So not just two bits stuck together, but five different animals. So this picture down here shows you the bird bones in red, which is basically the top half, and the dinosaur bones in black, which is the bottom half. So when, when they, the, this work was done, a lot of it was done using CAT scans. And in fact, I, I think um, CT scans and I think that uh, one of Phil Curry's uh, associates was also involved in this work and putting this all together. So when they looked at the specimen, what, you can see that they're able to do a really nice uh, scan of it. And it had the tail of a dromaeosaur, the body and head of a fossil bird, and then the legs were from three different animals. And what was even more funny about the legs is that they were actually the same leg. So they, they had a block, split it open, and there was a leg inside it, and the leg kind of split down the middle. A bit like if you put your chicken into a clay oven and then hacked it with a machete. If you split it down the middle, you'd have the same leg on both sides of your clay oven. So, yeah, it's the same leg. So this is kind of like a one-legged one animal, whatever it is. So they think it was probably the work of a Chinese farmer. So this Chinese farmer, he found this bit of fossil bird, and he thought, well... I've got some bits and bobs lying around in my workshop. Why don't I stick this tail on there? Why don't I pop these legs on there? When you look at the, the join between the tail and the body, it is literally just a sharp join. There, is no, there are no vertebrae leading up nicely into the rest of the animal. So unfortunately, it was a fake. And th the funny thing is that the tail was probably the most exciting bit of this animal because the tail turned out to be a new, new species. It was called Microraptor. But uh, all in all, I think this was really red faces for that museum in Utah, red faces for the National Geographic. And if they had listened to Phil Curry and a lot of other experts as well, then I don't think they would have got themselves into this mess in the first place. So let's talk about a few other Chinese fakes while we're here. And uh, this is, these are all fakes. I'm not, not gonna, this is the one that I showed on the, the, the title slide. This is my favorite. Actually, my favorite of all. I wish I had this fossil. So this is a fossil rat from China, except for the fact that this portion of the animal here, if you ignore that leg there, is actually a fossil fish. So they <laughs> took the fossil fish, they crafted these legs onto it, and they made it into a fossil rat. And that rat sold on eBay for, I think, eight and a half thousand dollars. <laughs> And the fossil fish is probably worth at least $15. So pretty good deal. Then we have this fake um, turtle here. And what's nice about this turtle is that he has a trilobite on his back. That they, they couldn't quite, you know, it wasn't enough to make this beautiful turtle. They had to add a trilobite as well. And then these guys here, you see these for sale on eBay all the time, 50, 60 bucks. And if you zoom in on them, if you're able to zoom in, and normally they don't put too good a photo on there because they don't want you to see this, then you will see that they, they are basically just made out of resin and then just painted. And uh, so how, how, will you, how will you know this? Well, look, any, look at any Chinese fossils that have any matrix involved, and they're usually highly fishy or very fishy in this case. They take the fossil bones, they smash them, and they reassemble them. If there's any multiple specimens, as I said before, almost certainly they're fake. Check the backbones. This backbone here, you know how this backbone was made? They just got a little piece of block of wood and they just went boom, 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 and they pressed it into the resin to make the impression of a backbone. And what they normally do is that in your backbone, your bones are not all crunched together. There's space between them for the discs. And that's what you'll see in fossils as well. But these guys, typically the backbones are just bone on bone on bone. 
fake bone on fake bone on fake bone. So that's another way to, to check. So they shouldn't be impressions. They should be standing out. And if they are standing out, they shouldn't be touching each other. So usually you can use acetone and dissolve. As I said before, you pop acetone on there and usually it's a bit of a sad moment for you if you've spent money on the fossil. And the last thing to be careful of is when you look at these bones, if you look at these ones, they're really smooth. And if you look at real bones, they've got a lot of texture to them, so it's quite easy to spot them. While we're talking about um, some fossil fakes and frauds and things, I, the reason I didn't put this one in the countdown is this is kind of an anti-fake. So what happened was that they found this fossil in the Santana Formation, and it got sold to a museum in Germany as a kind of pterosaur head. And Dave Martill went to visit there. He's a British paleontologist. And he thought it looked a bit weird. It was classified as a pterosaur, but he started picking away at this thing. And it turned out that it had been completely rebuilt. So the head was originally this, about this long. And it had been extended by about this much. So they'd stuck a load of extra bones on the no nose. And they'd used what we call car body filler <laughs> to build this head up to make it look like a pterosaur. So anyway, the team had to remove all of this car body filler, all of the spare bones. And it was a really irritating job because there was a lot of crud on there. And so they were so irritated by this dinosaur that they actually called it Irritator when they'd finished. So that's how it got its name. And it turned out that underneath this was a brand new dinosaur, the first early Cretaceous dinosaur from Brazil, a really unusual theropod. And the jury's still a little bit out on its exact lifestyle. For a while, they thought it was a little bit like um, the, some of the, the baryonyx from the UK, the, the fish-eating dinosaur. But now they're not so sure. But anyway, this is how it looks. And it's definitely a bit of an oddball. So isn't that exciting? It, we've anti-faked it. The fake was something that wasn't very interesting. And the anti-fake, what was underneath, was what was really interesting. So it's still a kind of fossil faux pas. But it's, I, I just added this one in. I, I don't think it kind of fits with the rest. But it's a great story. So that leaves us with number one, with this beautiful fake lizard <laughs> all the way from China. And number one is the Piltdown Man. And Piltdown Man is probably the most famous unfossil man. So that gives you a clue that probably not all is right with this specimen. He was found, or she was found, in Piltdown Gravel Pit in the UK. And it was reported by Charles Dawson, who was a, a well-known paleontologist in the UK. This is the actual site that they found this specimen in, which kind of looks like a, it's not really a gravel pit, it's more of a ditch. <laughs> it doesn't look like the most prepossessing site to be finding what was described as the missing link in hominid evolution. So Dawson said that he'd been given this skull fragment in 1908. And what had happened was that some workmen were working at this, this gravel pit, and they'd found this skull. And they actually thought it was a fossil coconut. So they broke it open. So that's why it was all broken up and not complete. And they went back, and they searched, and they found it had an ape -like, they found more pieces of this. They found more pieces of the skull. It had a human-like cranium, and then they found a jaw that was very ape-like. So it was named Eoanthropus dawsoni after Charles Dawson. So he got all the recognition that he deserved for finding this. But obviously, when you have a specimen that's this famous, and it is a missing link in hominid evolution, people started looking at it in more detail. And one of the guys who looked at it was Professor Keith from the Royal College of Surgeons in London. And he took the pieces that uh, these guys had put together that uh, Woodward and uh, his colleague um, oh, Dawson, I mean, and his colleague Woodward from the Natural History Museum. And he took their reconstruction and he took it apart and put it back together and made something that looked very much like a human. So this is what the non-human one. This is the, the Piltdown man that uh, Dawson reassembled. And he took those same pieces, took them apart and put them back together and made what looked like a very human skull. So publications in Nature as early as 1913 also suggested that this was a composite specimen. And fortunately, Dawson went to Sheffield Park, which was about four miles away from Piltdown, and found another Piltdown man. And that cemented his claim. So after that, everything is all right. And everyone realized that he must have been right. And these naysayers must have been wrong. So we're very lucky he found that second specimen. Anyway, it turned out that Piltdown was not quite the man we th thought he was. In 1953, a professor of anthropology demonstrated that the skull was actually a medieval human skull, a 500-year-old orangutan jaw, 
and some chimpanzee fossil teeth that had been filed down. So it was all a big fake. The bones had been stained with iron solution and chromic acid so that they looked old, but they were able to do the carbon dating to prove that, that these teeth were absolutely modern. It was, it was really quite easy once you had the material there. So there was a big question as to who might have carried out this fraud. Some really famous geologists were fingered during the day, and even Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who was the creator of Sherlock Holmes. But the finger really has to point at Dawson. After his death, in around um, 2003, a guy did a study on all of Dawson's amazing discoveries. And 38 of his specimens from fossil boats, fossil gold hammers, fossil mammal teeth also filed down, they were all proved to be fakes. So it wasn't just one fake, 38 different fakes. So you would have thought that somebody might have smelled the smelling salts and said, well, hang on a minute, this Dawson hasn't exactly got a great track record. So I've just put in one other example from Dawson. This is his Pevensey bricks. These were Saxon bricks that he discovered with, which were inscribed with the name of the port that he believed was, should have been the name of the port. And it actually, they, they were dated by thermoluminescence as being less than 100 years old. And the name of the port actually turned out to not be spelt that way. So if, if he was alive today, then he definitely would have been fingered for all of these crimes. So I think this is a fitting number one for a guy who really was a big, big cheater. So just to summarize, like everything else in life, paleontology features examples of man's stupidity, naivety, and guile. They range from the embarrassingly obvious to really some quite sophisticated frauds that have gone on through time. And I could have told you about another 50 examples. Don't buy amber online, especially if they have anything inside them, because you are going to be disappointed. Mammal skulls are being created in their thousands within the US as we speak. And almost every crustacean that you see on the internet is likely to have been painted onto the rock. And most countries have very little control over this. They know it's going on. Places like Brazil, China, Morocco, they know it's going on. But what can they do? There's whole workshops, whole factories producing these fossils. So it's really up to you as the individual to be smart and really if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. Look that gift horse in the mouth before you buy it. And just as a final disturbing question, just something for you guys to take home with you, how many other fakes have yet to be identified? So thank you very much.